Just like every other day, I return from the real life simulator, jump onto my computer, and am ready to pump out some videos, before I do that, it is time to check the comment section. Well, this happened. Thank you all for your overwhelming responses. It appears that options 2 and 3 garnered the most support. Between the two, a significantly larger number of you preferred to cover everything. Therefore, without further ado, let's dive back into the story. After the initial shock had subsided, Roland began to ponder. Undoubtedly, all this chaos must have been caused by Zero, or, more precisely, not entirely her doing. What did she gain by conjuring such a bizarre dream that tried to rob him of his memories and transform herself into a little girl? This modern society could not possibly be the recollection of Zero's memories. No doubt whatever Zero had attempted, her scheme had utterly failed. Roland began to wonder, what role did Roland supposed to play in this world? With questions swirling in his mind, Roland walked to his unit. He still retained his complete memories and could leave at any time, but to what extent could this world offer him? Upon returning to his unit, Roland inspected every part of the house, eventually making his way to Zero's bedroom. The small and modest room was very organized, with furniture lined up in order and not a speck of dust on the polished table or floor, this was an unbelievable achievement for a seventh grader. After a brief look around, Roland quickly discovered a diary. He picked up the pink notebook and flipped it open to the first page, greeted by text and drawings. Zero had written about her first encounter with Roland. With the school's relocation, she had come here for a homestay, and her landlord was a strange uncle named Roland. Roland worked at a bar, returning each day reeking of unpleasant alcohol odors. Zero despised it here, but her family had told her it was the cheapest place available, if she disliked it, she'd be sent back to the countryside. Roland slammed the diary onto the table. What a bizarre plot is this? It seemed like something straight out of a well, you know, a very inappropriate website, the kind of plot that, in reality, would have the FBI kicking down the door and have him arrested. Mulling over it, he picked up the diary and continued reading. The diary went on to detail how Roland had lost his job and, with no income, the two of them had to rely solely on each other. Roland will use the rent Zero's family had paid him for groceries, and Zero will be doing the cooking. After three months, Zero had gradually settled into the arrangement and their life was back on track. The last page of the diary describes an accident where Roland had fallen off a stool. Roland closed the diary, it seems that the dream has woven a modern identity for everyone involved, like a highly complex setup too complex for Roland's brain to process, resulting in him being in a coma for two months. There are also some books on the table, likely educational materials, belonging to Zero. He casually opens one and finds it to be a middle school chemistry book. Inside the book, there's a complete periodic table of elements before his eyes. Roland woke up, finding himself back in the city of Neverwinter. His two times into the dream world had allowed him to discern some patterns, and with a surge of excitement, he rolled out of bed. The first thing he realized was that the passage of time in the dream world did not align with reality, and although he hadn't yet calculated the exact disparity, the discovery intrigued him. Secondly, he noted his mental state was affected, perhaps due to the vividness of the dreams, he found that being active in the dream world didn't rest well. Roland hadn't yet tried sleeping within the dream world, but he planned to experiment with it next time. The nature of the dream itself was the final piece that captured his attention It differed significantly from any ordinary dream. The dreams had rules of their kind, 
and everything that happened inside was clear as if he had entered a new world. What secrets did it hold? Roland meticulously recorded all of these observations in his journal. As dawn broke, Roland summoned everyone to the castle's meeting room. In addition to catching up on the changes in the city of Neverwinter over the past two months, it was also time to prepare for the impending confrontation with the demons. Barov spoke first, noting that recruiting workers and refugees across the kingdoms of Grey Castle, Entral Winter, and Wolfhart would be a colossal task. Roland nodded in agreement, aware that the news of them defeating the church would surely reverberate across the continent. Soon, those nobles who had sided with the church might band together. They could not afford to delay, by any means necessary, he had to stay one step ahead. Roland also announced that Neverwinter's port would be fully operational by early spring. A substantial number of ships would be needed, perhaps necessitating the aid of the merchants in the fjord to properly transport the refugees. During these plans, Edith was officially inducted into the municipal hall as Barov's deputy. Barov wanted to politely decline, but Roland had already made his decision. Scroll reported that the process of training intermediate-level teachers was painfully slow, only Furlan had passed the intermediate assessment thus far. After some thought, Roland considered selecting the new intermediate teachers from among the students themselves. To encourage students to continue their education, Roland decided to introduce a scholarship system. Scroll initially thought it was similar to the reward system once promoted at the Changu stronghold, but Roland shook his head. The previous system was designed to attract more people into learning, while the scholarship system was intended to reward only the top students, encouraging the most talented to stay in school and study further. Roland planned to select the top 30 students, offering them substantial rewards, and have both Furlan and Scroll teach them until they pass the assessment to become intermediate teachers. Of course, Roland's intention was not solely to train teachers, these excellent students could also become researchers and administrators in various other positions if they chose not to pursue the educational path. Education was a crucial necessity. Given the limited resources available to Neverwinter at the moment, this was the best plan of action. Finally, Roland stood up, surveying all those present. In summary, the main tasks for the city hall in the near future were to increase the population, develop education, and enhance the industrial scale. He hoped that everyone here could fulfill their responsibilities before the arrival of an even more formidable and powerful enemy. At the end of the meeting, Roland asked Kyle to follow him for a discussion. Kyle followed Roland to the office, thinking he was going to be given a new product to manufacture. If not, he hoped to return to his work in the laboratory. Roland chuckled, his chief alchemist was as impatient as ever. Roland wanted Kyle to take on the role of minister of the chemical industry. Kyle didn't even hesitate before he refused, repeating the same reason he had given before. He didn't like managing people, he just wanted to continue with his research and experiments. Roland smiled, knowing Kyle didn't want to waste time on other matters, but what if Roland could offer him a deeper understanding of chemistry itself? Kyle's interest was piqued. Roland pulled out a sheet of paper from a drawer, a grid filled with scribbles, it was the periodic table of elements he had written from memory the night before. Kyle's eyes went wide, he tentatively reached out with trembling hands, as if he wanted to snatch this very treasure from the king's hands, yet was afraid of tearing it with too much force. Roland smiled and offered a deal, if Kyle agreed to become the minister of the chemical industry, the full and complete periodic table would be his. Furthermore, if Kyle did well, Roland promised to gift him an even more advanced and comprehensive chemistry book. After a moment's hesitation and with a deep bow, Kyle agreed, promising to do his utmost. Isabella was transferred from the basement dungeon to a regular bedroom for almost two months now, where she enjoyed complete freedom, even without the restraint of handcuffs or shackles. The food was exquisite and delicious, and there was no one here harassing her. The guards never talked to her, but they were respectful. She had everything she needed except the freedom to leave the room. But two months had passed, and Roland's absence troubled her deeply. Just then, footsteps sounded outside the room. The door opened, revealing not only the blonde which she had seen before, but also a man. Isabella recognized him immediately as Roland. 
She rose and curtsied slightly. Roland informed Isabella that although he had defeated Zero, he had not obtained anything from her. Isabella exclaimed in disbelief, that's impossible. Roland, curious, asked, why is it impossible? Perhaps a man cannot awaken as a witch and thus cannot inherit everything from Zero. Isabella shook her head, stating that gender was irrelevant, the spoils of victory in the soul battlefield were also the memories and lifespan, not just abilities. Even Zero couldn't absorb the unique abilities of a witch, otherwise, she would have devoured Isabella long ago. Isabella couldn't believe that Roland had not inherited even a sliver of memory. Roland asked with interest whether Zero had explained where all those who failed had gone. Isabella explained that they vanished completely as if they had never existed. But Zero had mentioned that there were two kinds of memories she absorbed, memories that had residual consciousness that could affect Zero herself and those memories that she fully controlled. Roland pondered for a moment, then nodded without saying anything. He then addressed the matter of Isabella herself. She bowed her head slightly, awaiting judgment. Roland told her that she should be grateful for her abilities, for she could not kill people directly. No matter how grievous her crimes were, even if she had assisted Zero in attacking Roland, Isabella was only an accomplice. Roland's voice was clear and calm as he declared that he would not kill Isabella, but she must atone for her sins. For some reason, as Isabella heard these words, something settled in her heart, and she knelt as if making an oath, declaring, If you can defeat the demon, I am willing to offer you everything. Even without her oath, Roland had planned to fight the demon to the end, but unlike the church, he was not willing to achieve victory at the cost of humanity's destruction. He also hoped that Isabella would change some of her habits from her time with the church. As Isabella kneeled and called Roland's master, Roland felt somewhat speechless and clarified that she was not to be his servant, he expected Isabella to assist Agatha in her research. Isabella was taken aback, wondering if that was all Roland required of her. Roland helped Isabella to her feet informing her that there would be no more pure ones. From that day forward, she would be known as a redemption witch. After these words, Roland turned and walked away, leaving Isabella somewhat in disbelief. Was this truly her final judgment? No imprisonment, didn't become a plaything, or even worse treatment? Isabella called out to Roland, inquiring about the well-being of Vanilla and Maggie. Roland looked back with a smile, reassuring that their circumstances were much better than Isabella's. As the room's door closed, Isabella relaxed completely, basking in the sunlight streaming through the window. Ignoring the glare, she squinted at the azure sky beyond the window. It was, she thought, a very beautiful day. Upon returning to the office, Nightingale expressed her discontent, believing that Roland's punishment was too lenient given that he had almost been killed by Isabella. Handing her a piece of fish jerky, which he also ate, Roland pointed out that it was Zero, not Isabella, who had tried to kill him. Nightingale retorted that it was Isabella's actions that led to Roland being dragged into the soul battlefield by Zero. Roland did not reply directly but instead asked if Isabella truly wished to fight against the demon. Nightingale could discern lies, so what Isabella said previously was all truthful. With a smile, he said that since he hadn't sustained any serious harm, he preferred to give these witches, who had not committed unforgivable sins, a chance at redemption, after all, they were victims of the church's brainwashing. This might set a precedent for others to understand that as long as one does not cross certain lines, redemption is available especially since the demon is their true enemy. They need to unite every bit of strength. Nightingale pouted, admitting she couldn't win the argument with Roland and promised to keep a watchful eye on Isabella. Roland walked over to the large window, his mind still echoing with Isabella's words. He pondered whether this was the reason Zero had repeatedly tempted him to surrender during their soul battlefield. Perhaps complete surrender was the only way to avoid side effects. This seems somewhat similar to when Roland first arrived in this world, taking over the body of the fourth prince. The prince's memories did not influence Roland, but he could access these memories at will. He considered what would happen if Zero encountered a resistor with a strong will. Even if they failed, their lingering will within the memories could potentially change Zero herself, her thoughts, personality, and even her beliefs. 
Over the 200 years, Zero, having devoured thousands of souls, perhaps was no longer the original Zero, but rather a composite of these many individuals. Knowing she was about to lose, Zero chose to inflict revenge on Roland before her demise, she had intended to infuse her will and memories into Roland. Although Zero knew that was her end, the result could be Roland would no longer be his former self. Maybe in Zero's mind, it's possible that one day, Roland could become lost within these thousands of memories, giving Zero a sliver of a chance to overtake his body. However, Zero had not anticipated that Roland was not of this world. The thoughts, information, and knowledge from these memories could not change someone who had learned and survived in modern society. Having done all this, Zero lost everything, including her memories, and became a pure and unblemished younger self, reappearing in the dream world. After falling asleep, Roland soon entered the dream world again, where it was already morning. The lack of rest over the past few days had left him somewhat weary. In total, he had gone about 20 hours without sleep. He got off the bed and walked into the living room, he saw the young Zero again. Zero looked at Roland with disbelief, it was the first time she had seen him get up so early. It was apparent that Zero had also just gotten out of bed. She quickly went to the kitchen to prepare breakfast, coming back with two breadsticks. Roland bit into one and found it was no longer crisp, realizing it was from yesterday. Zero mentioned that she had bought them last night at the cheapest price when the stall was closing, and the kind stall owner had even given her some leftover dough. Zero then shouldered her backpack, ready to head to her tutoring classes. Roland told her to be careful on the way. Noticing she was still wearing the same dress and white stockings she had on for three days now, and seeing no dust in the house, with her bedroom clean and tidy, there's no way that Zero was lazy or unhygienic, she likely didn't have many clothes to change into. For some reason, Roland felt a sudden pang of sadness. He rightly noted that this was his dream, yet he only had the original $300, well, $250 now, from when he first arrived. He started to think of ways to make money. After searching through all the cabinets and closets, he found some jewelry, quite modest in appearance. It was only when he checked the phone that he learned Zero's parents sent them $1,500 each month for living expenses. But now there was only $12 left in the account. Roland estimated that the jewelry might fetch around $1,000 or so, which would be enough for now. With a sigh, Roland's gaze drifted back to the storeroom, cluttered with a few pieces of old items. As he inspected these items, something was odd, he saw a heavy iron door. Perplexed, he pondered the absurdity of its placement, the wall it stood against was the exterior of the building, and they were on the eighth floor, this was a clear safety hazard. Roland found the key and unlocked the door, only to be greeted by an icy gust carrying snowflakes, revealing a snowy landscape beyond. The sight jolted him with realization, this was the Hermes' new holy city. He hastily slammed the door shut and took several deep breaths to compose himself. Turning to examine the rest of the apartment's walls, he found no other iron doors. Perhaps this door had been embedded into the structure when the apartment was constructed, rather than added afterward. Was this anomaly exclusive to his unit, or was it a peculiarity shared by the entire apartment? What world might the other rooms lead to? He shuffled back to his bedroom and rummaged through the closet for winter clothing. He returned to the iron door. The idea that leaving the door open could serve as an ever-running, electricity-free air conditioner amused him. Beyond the door lay a clearly demarcated world. It could very well be a fragment of Zero's scattered memories. Although devoid of people, there were tons of nearby structures. Roland entered one to find the food still fresh, steaming faintly. Even the grape seemed just delivered. After sampling a few, he looked around the area eventually uncovering a trove of high-quality gems in a small box. Without hesitation, he took all of them. Having taken what he could carry and stored the fresh food in his fridge, the thought of having the entire holy city to loot made him nearly burst into laughter. However, a sudden wave of dizziness overcame him. He woke up once again, he found himself lying in his own bed, what likely happened was exhaustion and the body's reaction to the abrupt change from cold to warmth, pretty much a heat stroke. At that moment, Roland became aware of a faint breathing beside him. 
Turning his head slightly, he saw Zero, sprawled next to him, drooling in her sleep as if dreaming of delicious food. Roland froze, then leaped up suddenly, woke by the commotion, Zero rubbed her eyes and sleepily inquired why he was staring at her. Rubbing the back of her head, Zero chided him for succumbing to heatstroke despite his age, noting that if it hadn't been for her, he would have spent the entire day sleeping on the cold floor. Roland gently ruffled Zero's hair, realizing it must have been quite an effort for the young girl to drag him from the living room to the bed, and she had stayed by his side the whole time. He expressed his gratitude with a simple thank you. Zero blushed at the acknowledgement, then mentioned she was off to make food, but Roland insisted she rest and declared that he would take on the cooking for the day. Zero looked at him incredulously. Making his way to the kitchen, Roland prepared breakfast. The table was set with crispy bacon, ham, eggs, and fresh fruit. Zero's eyes sparkled when she heard about the abundance of meat bought and now all in the fridge, her voice bubbling with excitement. Roland chuckled and mentioned they would soon celebrate with his upcoming paycheck. Reflecting on the previous day's events, Zero realized that Roland's heatstroke was likely a result of him trying to find a job. Roland didn't delve into details but reassured her that money would no longer be a concern. Zero, wise beyond her years, commented on her uncle's fragility with concern and even chided him for his lavish use of ingredients, noting he had added extra salt to the already salted bacon. Despite her criticisms, she devoured everything on her plate, wiped her mouth, and then announced it was time for school. Waking up, Roland found himself back in Neverwinter. He had spent three days in the dream world. While here, it was precisely noon. Calculating the discrepancy, he deduced that the flow of time between the two worlds was in a 1 to 8 ratio. During his days spent in the dream world, Roland had also managed to sell some items. Roland had sold off the armor, short swords, and crossbows he moved out from the holy city at very low prices, then used the proceeds to buy new clothes and books for zero. He noticed that many of the textbooks were blank, a clear indication that the dream world did not extend beyond his own consciousness any book he never read appeared empty. However, as long as he had glanced over a text, even if only once, or browsed on the internet before on Earth, Roland could extract detailed information from it. He quickly began to jot down everything he could recall, working diligently until noon. Nightingale appeared quietly in the room, concerned about Roland's well-being since he had yet to eat breakfast. Roland smiled and asked her to bring him some lunch and they could eat there together. Nightingale picked up a stack of papers from the table with a look of surprise. The papers described a mathematical model of a certain volume in terms of electromagnetic relaxation, a concept she glanced over before deciding to leave it be and proceed to go get Roland's meal. Before leaving, she mentioned that Barov had something important to discuss with Roland. Roland instructed Nightingale to tell Barov to come directly here. Upon receiving the message, Barov rushed over, touched by the level of trust Roland showed in allowing him into the king's chambers. When Roland inquired about the correspondence he had received during his unconscious state, Barov reported that there were 16 letters, mostly from various lords requesting trade or visits. Additionally, there were two from the Eastern Territory containing secret messages likely concerning negotiations about peace talks. Barov had replied to all the letters according to the requirements Roland had set previously. However, when it came to the Eastern Territory, they spoke of peace talks but in reality were unwilling to surrender their authority and privileges, hoping that Roland would maintain the tradition of the nobility that had lasted for centuries. Roland was somewhat disappointed, but he decided to wait until the next spring to address it. Barov then brought a secret letter from an astrologer association and another from the Kingdom of Dawn. Barov explained that the contents were somewhat strange. The astrologers had found traces of the Star of Extinction. A star that shimmered with red light and remained in a fixed position. Roland pondered for a moment, with his limited knowledge of astronomy, Roland knew that only objects in geostationary orbit could remain relatively stationary with the planet. But if the red moon were to appear in this orbit, it wouldn't be possible without affecting the planet itself, and observations also suggested that it should be very small in size. So the red moon was not a natural celestial body but a man-made satellite? However, this was completely against common sense. 
He was silent for a long while before putting the letter aside and instructing Baref to write a letter inviting the chief astrologer and all the other astrologers to come to the city of Neverwinter. He unfolded the second letter, which was about the death of the king of the kingdom of Dawn. The eldest son, and Pian Moa, had ascended to the throne. His hatred for the church had implicated many, he ordered the purging of the church's followers, cut off trade routes to the holy city, and launched a widespread hunt for witches. Many common folks were caught and slaughtered simply for previously believing in the church. Roland shook his head, it seemed unlikely that the Kingdom of Dawn could become a potential ally if the new king decided to act this way. Roland instructed Bareff to write a formal diplomatic letter congratulating Anpian on becoming king, but also to warn him to stop what he was currently doing. Pure One were not synonymous with all witches, and if Anpian considered witches as enemies, then he would be making an enemy of the Grey Castle. Bareff was worried that this might be taken as a threat. Roland was aware of this, but that was the point it was a threat. If Anpian continued on his path, Roland was prepared to replace him with a new king of dawn the following year. Roland needed a wise king who would stand with Greycastle, share similar values, care about its people, and join the fight during the upcoming Third Divine War. A complex expression appeared in Barov's eyes, a mix of surprise, exhilaration, and an unmistakable respect. He didn't say much, but bowed and said he would convey Roland's will to the new King of Dawn. As dusk approached, Roland received a message from Nightingale that Tilly wished to see him. Tilly arrived at Roland's office with Ashes, who offered to help Roland with his paperwork, a gesture that took him by surprise. He hadn't expected Ashes, who had always seemed to look at him unfavorably, to lend a hand. But Roland had a hunch about the reason for Tilly's visit. True to his suspicion, Tilly spoke with a calm tone, telling Roland that she had come to bid him farewell. She needed to make a trip to Slumbering Isle. After a moment of silence, Roland understood, while saying he would prepare a farewell banquet in her honor. He paused, struck by a realization, had Tilly set a trip to Slumbering Isle? Did that imply she intended to return? Tilly's light laughter followed. What, aren't you going to welcome me back? Big brother, she teased. Roland, caught off guard, opened his mouth, but found himself at a loss for words. Could it be because of the month of the demons? Tilly didn't deny it, but she questioned Roland, hinting it was also a possibility of something more. Roland was completely taken aback. With a warm smile, Tilly reassured Roland that she would take the news of his victory back to Slumbering Isle. She would tell everyone that the city of Neverwinter and Greycastle was finally free from the threat of the church, and there was no longer a need for the witches to hide away on the small island in the fjord. Once Roland was ready, Tilly would lead those witches who were willing to relocate to the city of Neverwinter and settle here. She playfully hoped that Roland wouldn't mind if they ate too much. A surge of indescribable excitement welled up in Roland's heart. The Western territory is always open to them. Roland's excitement was palpable, the current which building would likely be insufficient. He resolved to have adequate housing constructed for the witches of Slumbering Isle before the onset of spring. Tilly extended three fingers, hoping Roland would agree to her conditions. Firstly, she desired that the witches have the freedom to choose whether to stay in the city of Neverwinter or to move to other towns, to which Roland readily agreed. However, he suggested that for safety reasons, they should initially settle in the city of Neverwinter or stay in Slumbering Isle until the entire Grey Castle is unified, with the future open for them to decide. Tilly nodded approval. Secondly, if a witch did not wish to serve Roland, he could not compel and force them. Roland pondered before asking if he was allowed to tempt and persuade them instead. Tilly affirmed with a smile that coercion was off the table, but persuasion was acceptable. The final point made Tilly hesitate, unsure how to broach the subject, but Roland urged her to speak freely. Tilly proposed a condition she herself deemed rather stringent, she hoped that the sleeping spell, the organization she had created, could exist independently. Of course, a portion of their earnings would be remitted to the city of Neverwinter. Roland, not fully versed in the organization but aware that Tilly had established it to resolve the conflict between combat and support witches and to generate income for Slumbering Isle, realized that its independence meant that Tilly would oversee all the witches on the island. 
It was as if she was guarding against him, maintaining autonomy in managing their affairs and bounty assignments, even deploying members to the fjords. Roland, however, agreed without hesitation, stating it was perfectly fine as long as they adhered to the laws of the territory. Roland thought this was somewhat like the arrangement to a private company. Tilly, incredulous at her brother's swift agreement, seemed to seek confirmation again, which Roland provided reassuringly. Tilly relaxed, declaring she would depart in three days, taking ashes, Ithy, and Shadow Feather with her to resolve the issues with the Bloodfong before returning them to the city of Neverwinter. She promised to return before the month of demons, ready to stand alongside her brother against the demonic beasts until the great snows quelled. As Tilly left, Roland's concern dissipated amidst his excitement. When Roland realized that the witches from Slumbering Isle might migrate to the Western Territory, he felt joy but also a hint of worry. He wasn't sure whether or not he should incorporate them into the witch union. The union was currently managed by Wendy, who along with the members, had a great deal of trust in Roland and felt a sense of belonging here. However, the witches from Slumbering Isle were numerous, and if they were all to join the witch union, it would inevitably weaken Wendy's control and they might not feel the same sense of belonging. Not accepting them into the union could seem exclusive and make the witches feel left out. Now that Tilly had proactively brought this up, it relieved some of Roland's stress. Moreover, it was normal for Tilly to still have some concerns. Trust is something that needs time to build, and compared to the past, this was already a significant improvement. The banquet was held in the garden behind the castle. Molly looked enviously at Candle, commenting that living like this in the Western Territory was truly enviable. Various ingredients were laid out on a table, however, they were mostly raw, with a steaming hot pot in the middle. After all the witches had arrived, Roland announced that this was a deluxe hot pot banquet. The way to eat was simple, just put whatever they liked into the pot, cook it, and then enjoy. Tilly was the first to try. The essence of the hot pot lies in the broth, the cooked ingredients were delicious. Watching Andrea eating with joy, Ashes teased her by recalling someone who once said that food in its original form is the most authentic, without the need for any condiments or spices, claiming that condiments and spices were the barbaric way of cooking was not suitable for nobility. If it were before, Andrea might have argued back, but now all she wanted to do was to eat continuously, to savor the flavors, which was far more meaningful than idle talk. She dismissively glanced at Ashes and ignored her. Ashes just smiled and then they all began to eat together. After the banquet ended, Roland returned to his bedroom, still recording his knowledge. Anna came over and informed Roland that the steam turbine had been completed. Roland held Anna in his arms, praising her work. Looking at Anna, he was reminded of the conversation he had with Nightingale a few days earlier. Anna also noticed that Roland had something on his mind. Roland was unsure how to begin. In this world and era, no one would care how many women a noble had, for a king, it was normal to have a harem of hundreds. Anna had already guessed what Roland was thinking about, especially regarding Nightingale's feelings for Roland. Anna knew that the longer Roland delayed telling her, the more he cared about her feelings. However, Anna still hoped that Roland would share his thoughts with her sooner. Anna had never expected to win the affection of a prince initially, content just to be by Roland's side. That changed when Roland said he wanted to marry her. But Anna didn't think Roland had done anything wrong, she was happy that Roland chose to share his feelings with her. She suddenly looked at Roland and asked if he might not be from this world, right? In this world, even those who are not nobles would not hesitate or feel uneasy about such matters. Anna continued, similarly, there might be those in this world who would treat witches kindly but would not consider them as close friends. Recalling the wager she had with Roland, Anna planned to write down her guesses in a book and later ask Roland if she was correct. At such a point, there was nothing for him to hide anymore, Anna's observational skills and understanding were astoundingly strong. Roland nodded, confirming that, apart from some details, Anna was mostly right. Anna said Roland had brought his knowledge to this world and saved them. But Anna hoped that Roland could be more proactive and less cautious. She would talk to Nightingale properly, Anna bade Roland goodnight, and then she left. 
The situation in the royal capital of Dawn had become somewhat unstable recently, and even York, who didn't usually pay much attention to politics, could feel it. The taverns were abuzz with talk of rebellion by the lords within the territories of Dawn, trade had decreased significantly, and the transport of slaves had ceased. Soldiers could be seen arresting residents everywhere and even breaking into their homes for searches. Despite these changes, York believed that the alliance would not be greatly affected, although the new king's attitude towards witches was something that Roland would find highly disagreeable. However, York didn't think Roland would go as far as to tear up the treaty with the neighboring country over the issue of witches. York reminded himself that his only job was to convey Roland's will, these were not his concern. Taking advantage of the early hour, he planned to meet Denise first before deciding on the evening's entertainment. As he was about to set off, Otto suddenly came to him. York felt a headache. Noting Otto's visits never brought good news, but he couldn't just turn him away. Back in his room, York asked Otto if there was another message to be delivered to His Majesty. Otto shook his head, saying that this time he was here to ask for York's help, and handed him a letter and invitation to an exhibition. Otto didn't give York a chance to refuse, sipping his tea and stating that helping him was also helping King Roland. Otto had information that one of the items to be auctioned was a witch. York was puzzled, the new king was arresting witches, and if York intervened to save the witch, it might affect the relations between the two kingdoms. But Otto assured him that the new king wouldn't break the alliance over one witch. York didn't understand why Otto was doing this. Otto thought of Andrea and remembered that she too had been a witch that he couldn't save. King Roland had once said that witches should not perish due to the church's malicious slander. They were people too. Perhaps Otto's actions were driven by a sense of guilt towards Andrea. Without further questions, York agreed to help. The two men took a carriage to the exhibition, where they were greeted by a beautiful woman with an impressive figure wearing a mask, who introduced herself as number 76. The woman led York through a secret door and into the exhibition. The setting was very dark, making it difficult to see anything. Then suddenly, the stage became the only source of light, immediately capturing everyone's attention. A man dressed in formal attire ascended the stage and bowed to the audience, greeting them with respect. He then announced that the exhibition was officially beginning.